Please take the roll. Mayor Kenny? Here. Councilmember Cody? Here. Councilmember Hornpole? Here. Councilmember Goodsby? Here. Mayor Potemzerian? Here. Councilmember Adams? Here. City Manager? Here. P. Turner? Here. DPW Director? Here. Finance Director? Here. And Public Safety Director? Here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Public hearings, we have none. Citizen comments and agenda related items. This is the portion of the meeting. If there's anyone in attendance who would like to comment on tonight's agenda, please come forward. Please state your name and address. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to comment on tonight's agenda? So now we'll move on to the consent agenda. All agenda items marked with an asterisk are on the consent agenda and considered by the city manager to be routine matters. Prior to approval of the consent agenda, any member of council may have an item from the consent agenda removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Consent agenda items include approval minutes, approval of payroll, monthly bills, notification regarding next work session. Is there action to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion the council to take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. No, sir. I have a motion by council member Hornkel. Support by Council Member Goodspeed to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will you please take the roll? Council Member Cody? Yes. Council Member Hornbull? Yes. Council Member Goodspeed? Yes. Mayor Kenny? Yes. Mayor Botem Zaring? Yes. And Council Member Adams? Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Unfinished business, we have none. New business. There's a presentation by David E. Wilson, CPA and Finance Director Ed Bradford on the June 30th, 2013 audit. I am Dave Wilson and work with Ed. And we have in the past in our this year doing the presentation back to back with me emphasizing the audit and with Ed emphasizing the numbers. The audit opinion is, as stated at the beginning of the audit, a single audit opinion, which I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on because this is not the same kind of an audit that you have with a normal financial audit. First, Yes, we do obtain reasonable assurance whether or not the financial statements are free of, quote, material, unquote, misstatements. <coughs> now, you may think that material misstatements mean that maybe it's 10 or 15 cents off. No, these are in the 30 to $40,000 range. We didn't find anything wrong, but when it talks about material, these are big numbers. They're not little. Secondly, a reasonable basis. In other words, we looked at not just the numbers. We look at the numbers, where they fit, how they're categorized, what they mean, and are they presented fairly in every reasonable way. Again, we get into this concept of reasonableness and materiality. Okay, am I saying they're right? No. Am I saying they're reasonable and pretty well correct? Yes, in reality we had no adjustments to speak of at all. Okay? Therefore, it comes down to a clean or unqualified opinion. In our opinion, financial statements referred to in the above present fairly, again, emphasize the word fairly in all material respects, 
the financial condition and a ski, obviously, we have no problem with that side of the coin. Okay, now we get into something different that you haven't seen an awful lot of. And that's the single light. The single light requires certain other things to be looked at. In particular, in particular we're not dealing with numbers now. We're dealing with compliance issues. Federal government is a lot more worried about you complying with their laws, rules, and regulations than they are with um, uh, how you really spend your money. As long as you meet their rules, you're in compliance, everything's okay. So, still conducted in accordance with auditing standards, but we really look at compliance and internal controls. In a normal audit, we're saying we didn't see anything wrong. In a single audit, we are looking at internal controls. It is basically risk-based. So the lower the internal controls, the higher the risk. And therefore, the worse we have to audit. So it's risk-based, and that's very much present in a compliance type of audit. We found no deficiencies in internal controls. Is everything perfect? Goodness, no. Do we make corrections verbally while we're in the audit? Yes, we do. But were there anything worth writing up that was significant? No, there was not. There were no instances of non-compliance. Okay, so we've got a clean audit, no instances of non-compliance, and no deficiencies in internal control. Three major items, all of which in the city of are clean. Why is it a single audit? Basic rule, $500,000 in expenditures. Okay, now, it doesn't mean income, that's in expenditures during the year. Why were you single audit this year? One reason, your CDBG, your Community Development Block Grant, which was $330,000, which surrounded the Bluefish Restaurant. Now, how much compliance do we have to worry about? None. It fed through the city. The city had no authority over much of anything. The money came in, the money went out. But we have to report it. It must be reported through a government agency. That's the reason you see it. And the rest was pretty well came in EPA. Once you have this situation of $500,000, you'll bear the term OMB Circular A133, that is the Single Audit Act. And there are no findings or question costs which are part of the Single Audit Report. Do you have any questions on the audit, the opinion on the audit, or where it's a little bit different? The clean, everything's good. I've still got one thing I want to say, but do you have any questions about any of that? Last thing I'd like to do, at least cover, and I will say quite frankly, this is one of the nicest audits we do. And that's because of the people you have on staff that work for the city of Manistee. No, I'm not required to say this in any way, shape, or form. It's just a real pleasure to work with the staff in the city of Manistee. And to me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I do have one question. Yeah. When you conduct the audit, what um, Sampling, how much do you test? Okay, it is, uh, we test a sample size based upon the materiality on what we do. It's all statistically sampled. So I can't tell you what the sample is per se. It depends on two factors. One is what is the sample size itself, and the second is the risk. The risk is a big factor. Mm -hmm. In your particular case, 
if I remember the total sample size was like 1,200 or 1,300, and the sample that was audited was about 47 or 50. Numbers wise. Does it state in here what your sample size, what areas did no, you test? It does not. It's in the work papers. Okay. We have two major areas we use sampling on. One is your uh, disbursements during the year. Mm -hmm. And we take the number of checks written and then do a statistical sample size based upon those checks. Now, first, I will also say anything material, there is a materialist level, mm -hmm. anything above that level, we automatically test, period. What's that level? I don't know, to be honest with you, without looking it up. Um, it would be about, it's 75% of the materiality level, so it would be approximately $22,000. That's approximately, but I'd have to look it up. Right, is that like all these first minutes? I mean, do you check like payroll? I mean, what all are okay, you? Okay, payroll is a separate, completely separate uh, statistical sample on mm -hmm. payroll. Bear in mind, Payroll is not just a statistical sample, which is a very small number. Again, there's a judgment call here. Who do we always check? Anyone who has access to the payroll records. So, Michelle gets her payroll check checked every time we're there. Uh, anyone who has access to payroll records has detailed check. Now, what do we mean by detail? We go in, pick a paycheck, reconstruct it, test what the authorized salary level is, then redo the check by hand. So it's not statistical in that case. We actually do those. Then we'll select about five others. <coughs> and they are basically statistical, but the same kind of sampling amount. Disbursements, yes, it is. And what all areas did you toss? I mean, disbursements, what other? Disbursements, receipts, uh, that's about it, really, for, for stat sampling. Everything else is, we use a, a program, actually, called PPC, mm -hmm. which is um, one of the two accepted audit programs and such. <laughs> gives you a long checklist of, in the case of disbursements, it's about six pages long. And so it's not just testing stat samples, it's testing other areas within disbursements. And we use that for capital asset, capital outlay. Um, there's another one for payroll, there's another one for uh, receipts, or actually two for receipts. There's another one for expenditures specifically in areas that are business-like. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, in your packet, I had given you the audit and a memo from um, my office with some pretty detailed information about the different funds and then also the actual uh, detailed financial reports for those particular funds that can handle the stuff off of our accounting system. Um, one thing that we wanted to talk about with the data that you want to talk about that I'll mention briefly here is we always do a budget amendment in June in order to try to anticipate what the year-end balances are going to be based on actions that council have taken during the year, based on um, things that have arisen, whether it's you know, unexpected repairs or what have you. Um, we, we normally are really close. Again, we were like that this year, but we did have two departments where the expenditures were slightly higher than the, the budget of changes that we put through in the budget amendment. Public works was over by about 17000 The reason for that primarily was um, more repairs and maintenance than we anticipated. And we did have some costs with the, uh, the fuel leak that had been over at the city garage 30 years ago that was still required to monitor. We had some professional services related to that. And then also fuel use is a little bit higher. 
So that over budget, I made a budget. Actually, we didn't do a budget amendment on the, uh, the public works department. I thought they were going to be roughly where they were, but um, we ended up being about sixteen thousand over. That's not about a one million dollar budget, so it's a pretty small percentage of that. And then parks and recreation was over by about fifteen thousand. Primarily, that was the veterans memorial. We incurred all those expenses and recorded them in the parks department, but we got reimbursed back on those from the community foundation. So it's just a matter of the scope and the timing of that primarily. Um, I wanted to just go through some of the highlights. Again, you've got the detailed memo from me in your packet. Um, one of the things that's on the front of the audit, which was a result of the <coughs> 34 back in 2003, um, was we now do government-wide financial statements. Those don't have a lot of meaning from, for day-to-day -day management and probably don't have a lot of meaning to city council because it just aggregates everything. But it is kind of interesting to point out um, some of the numbers just to look at the scope of what you're looking at. So for the citywide, across all our general activities, streets and water and sewer and uh, enterprise funds, we have about $60 million in total assets. Our total net assets is about $36 million. And that increased about $760,000 or 2.2% um, over last year. Total revenues were about $12.8 million. The increase of about $1.7 million. And our total expenses were $12 million, which is an increase of about $1.5 million. 14%. Most of the increase in revenues came from um, charge for services and investment income on the oil and gas fund. Uh, this chart breaks out the government wide revenue. You can see the biggest piece of that is uh, charges. Um, <coughs> uh, taxes is about 27%, grants and contributions, 14%, and then some other investment. And you can see state revenue in that picture is, is fairly low. Um, Government-wide expense, uh, again, the largest is water and sewer, and then the next largest is public works. Those two combined across all of what the city does is about 54%. Just gives you an idea of, uh, of the areas of, of uh, activity in the city. Now we're going to move on to some of the fund-related uh, statements. The general fund, um, we had revenues of $5.7 million and expenses of $5.77 million. So our ending fund balance decreased by about 53000 Our ending fund balance um, turned out to be $1,121,904. Um, that's roughly 0.9% uh, of our operating expense was that $53,000 deficit. So very, very small, very close to the end budget. That decrease was primarily due to the $70,000 that we talked about with council that we needed to transfer to the street fund to finish out the first street project. Without that transfer, the general fund would have been in the black. Um, and just as a reminder to council, when we adopted the budget for the last fiscal year, we originally had budgeted a $25,000 reduction in fund balance because of legal fees that were related to some of our tax appeals. So without that $70,000 transfer uh, that we had to do, we would have been about uh, $17,000 to the good. So actually, it's a pretty decent performance for the general fund overall. General fund balance, this chart just shows you where we've been. Um, we had the drop back in 2005 through 2006 and 7. Those were transfers out to the capital improvement fund when we had some excess fund balance. As you can see, we built that back up um, pretty much every year. Water and sewer utility, just some quick highlights. Revenues, 3.7 million. Our operating expense was about 2 million. The remainder of the difference between the revenues and operating expense is debt service and capital outlay. We had positive cash flow of about 153000 Our depreciation, I throw in there, it's a non-cash expense, but it's $1.1 million per year. That just shows you the volume of assets that we have in the water and sewer utility, because most of those are depreciated over a pretty long life, because they're long-lived assets, but we still record up $1 million in expense each year of depreciation. Our change in net position for the water and sewer utility was about a negative 356000 and our net position at the end of the year was $9.9 million. The thing that drives most of those numbers, if you boil it down, is the reduced revenue from the OAKS, which was about $300,000 lower. And we talked with council about that pretty early on in the last fiscal year. I do want to um, commend Jeff uh, Makula and, and the water and wastewater staff for really squeezing the expenses last year after we realized that the OAKS were going to have a reduction in their revenues because they really did um, we're pretty surgical on looking at their costs and trying to reduce those, and that really helped the performance of the water and sewer utility last year. Um, just quickly on some other funds, the refuse fund uh, had a 
deficit or net loss of about 53000 That's a planned thing. City Council has been trying to uh, bring down the fund balance over time um, by uh, controlling the, uh, the rate increases. Um, our ending fund balance in the refuse fund was 169000 At some point, we're not going to be able to continue to do that. I and mean, we'll, we'll revisit that in the next year's budget. Um, simply, as the tax base declines and as the cost of the contract goes up, that, that gap gets bigger every year. At some point, we're going to have to make some adjustments to the rates. And we've held that off in the last couple of years because of the water and sewer increases, trying to buffer the citizen a little bit. Our oil and gas fund uh, increased by 636000 in net income. The largest piece of that was our returns last year. We had roughly $950,000 in investment returns, which we realized and unrealized, which is a tremendous year. And um, people can see that in there if they have any brokerage accounts. The stock market had a very good year last year. Our ending fund balance in that fund is about $9.4 million. Uh, street funds, um, they had a positive performance of $123,000. We did close out some projects. Um, and our ending fund balance in those two funds is about $267,000. We were pretty low the year before, so that's an increase of, of, of say, of 123,000 over what it was last year. So that's going to give us a little bit more flexibility as we're moving forward and um, looking at streets. And we're going to be talking more about streets tonight and plus in December at the work session. Uh, capital improvement fund, uh, so we had $74,000 um, that, that we reduced our fund balance by. That was all budgeted funds. Uh, that fund is largely obligated. For the next few years, and our ending fund balance in that fund is about eighty-three thousand dollars. And keep in mind, in the capital improvement fund, some of those projects do tend to straddle fiscal years just because of timing, or some of it's dependent on grants when those grants come in. Um, but in general, the capital improvement fund is, is on target from what we've been looking at. Marina, we have two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars in revenue. Um, Forty thousand of that is a transfer in from the capital improvement fund to help support the debt service for that facility. We had net income of about a uh, negative $50,000 loss, but 67000 of that was related to depreciation. So depreciation is a non-cash expense. Um, and we had a net cash flow of about negative 27000 That's the most worrisome thing. Last year wasn't a great year at the marina. Um, we need to do better. We need to fill more slips. We need to sell more gas. Um, we've got a nice facility. I think we're marketing. I think the word is getting out. But we've got to turn that around. And a lot of that is so much dependent on the economy, so dependent on the fishing, so dependent on the price of fuel. But we really, I think, need to look hard at how we're going to market that facility to try to bring in more boaters because we can't continue to, to bleed cash like that. And even though it wasn't a terrible year, we'd like to see that be positive. Um, boat ramp, we had revenue of 28000 um, That's down some from some of the years we've had in the past, and that's primarily related to fishing and weather. The fishing's down, you're going to get less fishermen if it's really good, because work gets out and a lot of people come from NC. Um, our net income was about a $14,000 loss, but again, 24000 of that was non cash depreciation. And we had just a slightly negative cash flow last year, which I'm not worried about because the, the boat ramp tends to be fairly stable. Um, just a few comments. Um, you know, times continue to be challenging. Um, it seems like every time we turn the corner on the revenue challenge, there's, there's other things coming. Our property values are continuing to go down. We saw that last year in the last year budget. Although they think they're finally leveling off and hopefully turning the corner here soon. Um, we're still having some inflationary pressures on some of the things we purchased. Um, so those are two things that are both um, not, not positive from a financial standpoint. And then there's a lot of ongoing uncertainty. So um, personal property tax loss is going to be looming in the next budget here. Um, Health care, you know, what's going to happen with that. And water and sewer revenues and ability to fund the items, we need to keep uh, looking at that and being diligent about that. Um, as we do every year and, and we'll continue to do and did last year, we identified budget variances to council throughout the year. And um, all the department heads are pretty good about scrutinizing their expenses. And we have thoughtful discussions about the size and scope of the city services through our white papers and our financial projections and the budget process and then looking at cooperation and collaboration where we can. So overall, last fiscal year, I think, was given the financial uncertainties out there, it's a pretty decent year. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you.
and he went to consideration of purchasing a 2014 International Work Star Salt Blade truck. The City of Manistee Department of Public Works has solicited a bid to replace the oldest snow plow in the fleet. The proposed truck is a salt blade truck and will be the public's first response to ice and snow conditions. The proposed truck has an underbody scraper blade along with a paraglide wing blade. The box is stainless steel and is designed specifically for sand and salt application. This purchase was approved in the original 2013-14 motor pool budget approved by City Council in May of 2013 and was retained as a priority in the revised 2014 motor pool budget as presented to City Council at their October 8, 2013 work session. Is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion the Council to take action to approve the purchase of a 2014 International Workstar 7400 from Wheeland Sales in the amount of $154,479 and further authorize entry into an installment purchase agreement for such a event. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Hormel, supported by Mayor Pro Tem Zaring, to approve the purchase of the two International Workstar 7400s. I just have one. You have to remember that West Shore Bank is a low bidder of 1.33%, so I think that's a pretty good deal for the city. And no extra fees? No. Included in your packet, Mayor and Council, was a much larger version of the motor pool budget. If there are any questions you would like answered regarding that updated motor pool budget before you act on it, we'd be happy to try and answer those questions. I think it's important we try to highlight in the agenda item that Mayor Kenny read in regards to that this was part of the original motor pool budget that was approved in the 2013-2014 City Council budget that was approved in May of 2013. What's the asset like on these trucks? It depends on who you ask. The dealers tell us 16 years is when we should be planning out the replacement of these vehicles. In the motor pool plan, we've actually budgeted for 20 years replacement. So we would like to get on a schedule. We've got 10 of these trucks, and we would like to get on a two-year cycle where every two years we're able to replace those. There are four trucks that are right now. Three of them are 20 years old, and one of them is 21 years old. And I can testify that those trucks, when they get to that age, are in need of severe maintenance, and they're in the shop and not out on the streets doing the work they need to do during the winter. You know, when we look at this schedule, we're going out to year 2017. We're taking in a lot of debt for replacement. Because I understand the need that, you know, when you start placing this equipment, you know, talking about replacing every two years, my concern is, as we start approving these for replacement, my concern is in the outgoing years, which is not that far away. And what can we do now to kind of minimize that kind of obligations that we're looking at? If you look at the age of these vehicles, we've got one that was purchased in 1992. 
and then we've got three that were purchased in 95. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to do with uh, this count is what all those replacements are scheduled out to be. And what we're trying to do is to not get a, a group of trucks that are all of the same age that all then need to be replaced at the same time. Uh, and that requires tremendous you know, cash uh, from, the, from the motor pool. So what we are trying to do, and, and this truck that, that is on the agenda tonight was actually trying to be purchased last year. And it just didn't happen within that budget year. So we have taken that two year and accelerated it so that in 14, 15, 16, and 17 that there's a purchase each year and then we're trying to prolong those, those out and then get on a two year cycle after that. I understand that and I understand tonight's, but I guess my concern is the outgoing years and what we can do now and maybe adjust it so we're not hitting ourselves so hard. And 2017 is really not that far away. Um, you want to talk about the cash flow? Well, it's just something I think we need to be thinking about. What can we do now to, to minimize? I think one thing to keep in mind is the motor pool um, committee and the people that, that use the equipment daily, they evaluate that stuff on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis. So this plan will likely change. Not, will, not likely, it will change as, as different things happen, or maybe a machinery breaks. The, the way to, the way to, um, you know, you're looking at 2017, um, you know, I, what we've tried to do is, uh, is to make the ending cash, I love this line on the bottom here, um, say, not dip below 250000 um, The only way to keep that from happening or to make that even be higher than 250000 is to try to extend the life of the equipment or to downsize the fleet. There's, there's really no two ways about it. The other option would be to send even, over even more money from the general fund, which this plan already assumed a 3% increase in, in general fund and water and sewer fund money. So there, there's, there's only three inputs in that equation. You either send over more money, you reduce the size of the fleet, or you try to extend the life out. And I think, I think we can extend the life of the fleet out by, by doing some good preventive maintenance practices. Um, maybe reduce the size of the fleet, but that's a little too early to tell. So we, we tried to put together a plan that just shows you kind of the magnitude of the equipment and what we're, what we're thinking about, but those actual year-to-year -year decisions are going to have to be kind of made on the ground that people are using the equipment in, in consultation with the budget process. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, too, this, this uh, anyway, how you go out 20 years or 10 years on an analysis, like this is extraordinarily sensitive to inflation rates, the interest rates to the estimated cost. You can change these numbers dramatically by changing your assumptions a little bit. We've tried to do reasonable assumptions, but who knows what the economy is going to be, what the interest rates are going to do. If, if interest rates, if we have a really high inflation, you got to redo all these numbers and you do have to make some other adjustments. If the Federal Reserve keeps the interest rate really low, then, then maybe you have some more flexibility. But I mean, they definitely maybe speak to the size of the fleet, but, but that would be something that he and David would basically have to make that determination moving forward. No, my only comment is towards these outgoing years and looking at what you have. I mean, I understand how old this fleet is, and it's not that I'm not approving tonight's purchase, but I do have concerns. With, when you put the schedule out here, the kind of debt that the city is going to be incurring here in just a couple of years by purchasing so much. So I'm saying, so can we go back and look what at it? Now to try and minimize that impact. Because yeah. if you look at the debt, not only in this fund, but you know, in the other funds that we sure. have, the debt that we're paying as a city and trying yeah. to reduce that. Well, and that's the exact exercise that, uh, that Dave Bachman and Ed Bradford and I did. It was, to go through and, and make sure that we understood how old all these, uh, what all these assets were, and then we, we reconditioned them and gave them new service lives based on how they are today. And then kind of came up with this priority list um, from what we want. What I would like to see is that those trucks get replaced on an 18-year cycle, and that's what we've had in the past. But the, the fund doesn't support that. So we're gonna have to extend those lives out to 20 years and so this was a, a really a complete effort to look forward and try to avoid some of those issues that, that you're alluding to. Thank you. <coughs> yeah.
Do they say their own Council Member Harpo? Yes. Council Member Adams? Yes. Council Member Fiske? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Council Member Cody? Yes. And Mayor Kenny? Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. And so we'll move on to notices, communications, and announcements. A regular part of each council meeting is report from a cooperating agency, organization, or department. Tonight we're going to hear from Ms. Kathy Adair Morin, who will report on the activities of the Alliance for Economic Success. Currently within the city, um, 
Okay. Yes, I would refer to actually with the marketing for the harbor um, and the marina. We were actually that just met with the harbor commission today for a, a second session. We created a draft strategic plan. It's the first time they've done it. And so that was really meant to be a subset of the city's strategic plan. So not to replace it, but how can the Harbor Commission for the goals of the city's strategic plan? Um, I think it's it's off to a really great start and quite encouraging. Um, the marketing and cooperation is really a key part of that. Um, and he's, for example, working um, cooperatively with Onakama and Arcadia, and as a county, the three of um, the three ports working together in conjunction with the Visitors Bureau to really highlight the ports and, and the activities the harbors that we have here. Um, so I think by looking at that Harbor Commission plan, um, it really kind of prepares them to look a little more forward thinking of what do we want to accomplish as a commission and how we're going to get there and what are different ways we can look at to improve our facilities. So I think that's just the first step. Um, we have to go back and revise a draft a little bit more, which is good because we added more to it. Um, and then I'm sure it will come for you um, within a few months after the Harbor Commission um, approves it. So um, and I think there has been discussion, <coughs> if it's successful, that there may be um, other opportunities with other commissions within the city to look at another plan. It was a very short plan, five, <coughs> five pages, um, just kind of just making sure what is in the same direction moving forward. Um, <laughs> another project we are looking at um, is the River Park Condo Project. I know it's been um, sitting there for quite some time. However, quite recently we've been talking with um, the NBC, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, as well as the Michigan of Housing, um, looking at brownfield uh, redevelopment. So, Reviving the project and really um, hoping to start pursuing that a bit more to get some things, you know, get us all rolling on that project. Um, so once we get moving on that, um, the support of the city will be definitely key when, when the time comes for that. Um, also, part of the River Park, Park Condo area is the North Corridor project, which I talked about last time I was here. Um, kind of the Corridor of Washington Memorial Rev, that area, um, back in later last year, had done a study that we were able to see, secure grant funds for. <coughs> we look at that, that area as a whole. Um, and so, one of the works of developing another, or I should say developing, I'm starting another meeting to look at maybe some improvements to the Veterans Memorial area. And then also some discussions about the North Channel Outlet. So there is a little, you know, some activity going on there. Again, as you know, it doesn't happen overnight, um, but there are definitely things in the works on those. Uh, let's see. Another is the um, downtown recruitment and um, Main Street DA Economic Restructuring Committee. I'm um, part of that. Um, Mitch is also working with um, me. Well, Mitch and I, and then um, Susan Riley from Century 21. Create a, a subcommittee to look more specifically at some downtown recruitment, trying to get a little more aggressive to fill some vacancies. Um, Main Street at the state level can provide market research and data, which we can also get from my small business counselor, of what are some of the um, deficiencies. So, for example, when Bluefish Kitchen was approached, um, Travis was able to take a study to them and say, hey, look, we have data that shows. That, you know, I think it was a twelve million dollar food and beverage leakage. So you know, leakage, food and beverage leakage, leakage is kind of weird term to use. Um, but in our downtown, so that was I think pretty instrumental in getting Chuck and Connie to really seriously look and say, you know, we were looking at expanding. Maybe this is a great step. And from um, my comments and talking with them, even as recently as last week, you know, this is exceeded their expectations which is always great to hear, as opposed to, you know, why do we do this? So um, we're really hoping to pick up some momentum and start um, looking at other other businesses that are just expanding. Um, again, looking at Chuck and Connie and saying, hey, this is work for you. Who else do you know that might want to come here too? Who, you know, let's go to Big Rapids. Let's, let's look at other communities and look at concepts that are successful and or existing businesses that are successful. But also not forgetting um, somebody, you know, homegrown that might be interested in starting themselves, something of themselves. So um, regardless of what direction it comes from or how it comes, we definitely want to be able to support that. And um, as you know, filling up River Street is, has been a priority um, I mean, for, for years, and I've heard that a lot in the time that I've been here. 
and also as part of downtown, um, the Vogue Theater, and so it's, it's getting close. <laughs> uh, they're hoping, hoping to open Sled Bell Weekend. Um, more recently, we were able to um, secure another $150,000 grant from the Olson Foundation. Um, there's other grants, things in the works, um, and so Beth Wallace has been retained to, I don't know if you have met her, um, but she's been retained to work through some larger fund development gifts, such as you know not just twenty-five dollars here, but more of twenty-five thousand <laughs> to really move this forward. So she's been doing a lot of tours. Um, I would encourage you, if anybody's interested, to take a tour. Um, just the transformation of that building has been incredible. They've got drywall up. They're really um, getting it so you can see some shape now of what's going to happen. So um, it, that's that's been quite exciting as well. Other projects um, in the area directly affecting the city, um, like I, I said, there was uh, four infrastructure projects in the works, two of which are directly impacting the city. That would be the Nasty Township and Father Charter Township. But we're working through those, hoping to get um, resolutions on them. And again, Father uh, Charter Township has been in the works for 20 years. <laughs> uh, but hopefully, the Nasty Township project will move a little bit, a bit quicker than that. Um, also, I touched on the redevelopment of Portage Point Inn. Um, we're looking at a $13.5 million project there. And again, just because it's not directly in the city doesn't mean it won't positively impact um, the community. We're looking at um, redevelopment of the hotel, of the food and beverage, all the outbuildings, um, the marina. It's going to be quite a significant project. Um, and again, you know, even during the Harbor Commission discussions, and you know, Harbor or a marina, uh, you know, a marina at Portage Point Inn will only benefit the community and the region as a destination for voters along the Arm of the See, the Lakes to Land Regional Initiative, um, the city's been involved in that, but that is um, a collaborative effort between, it's about 15 to 16 municipalities in Humanity and Lindsay counties. Um, the tribe is also unofficially participating, they've been um, participating but not as an official on paper <laughs> participant. Uh, but that has been um, fantastic as far as getting um, updated master plans. Some communities in these smaller townships didn't even have planning commissions. Um, so they've really been making a lot of strides in that. Uh, most recently, the initiative was awarded $115,000 through the, uh, the State Department of Treasury to look at some unified zoning language um, across the, the borders as well as an agriculture innovation district, so focusing on the food processing and agriculture um, is really prevalent in our region. And also really, another part of that, very, very recently in the past week or so, um, working with the Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development, right there, um, on some um, agriculture education and kind of getting kids and younger generations excited in agriculture, and it's such a huge part of our area um, there's really not a lot of succession planning and things like that. So you've got these farms that have built up for so many generations, but then younger kids or young adults that really don't have that culture of wanting to continue on with that. So um, really putting a value and emphasis on agriculture. I mean, Michigan is the number two state in the country and in California as far as diversification of agriculture. So um, let's celebrate it and work with what we do have. So, um, as part of the Lakeland and Regional Initiative, the City of Manistee has a visioning session on November 21st. I'm not sure if that's just planning commission or is that? I think it's just planning. Just planning. Okay, so it's mostly planning commissions that have been working with. Um, but they'll be working with a session and a survey, and um, and then back at later we'll get them the results for for that. So. Um, while some communities have had, again, full-on um, master plans for the first time, it's just it's varying levels depending on the community and the needs. Um, the City of Manistee and the Planning Commission, as you can imagine, were much farther ahead in experience and education and knowledge than a lot of the other communities participating. So they didn't need as much handholding <laughs> as some of the others. Um, the Explore the Shores program is ongoing and countywide. Um, the City of Manistee has the Arthur Street Boat Launch and Fishing Pier, the First Street Beach, <coughs> Fish Cleaning Station, um, Accessible Areas at First Street Beach, the Baboon Beach, and the Lift at City Marina. So um, those have all been 
again, just great sites, great for the community. I actually had somebody from Delicious Big Rapids reach out because the DNR had told her to talk to me and see about how to do it right. So I thought that was pretty cool um, that we're being looked at as um, really a, a great example of what to do. Um, we also on this Thursday have John Beard from the Great List Fisheries Trust coming to tour the area. Great List Fisheries Trust was um, instrumental in the fish training station and, and other sites around the area. So um, Tim is really good at <laughs> getting the people out of Lansing up here, which again, it, it just in turn gets them excited about you know, seeing on the ground level what we have going on in the community. So when we do put in a grant application, they are already familiar with the initiative. They know it's a cooperative effort. They know there's a larger plan. And we've been, again, very successful, thankfully, in, in getting funding for those. So um, the last thing I want to talk about, um, but definitely not least, is um, the new economic development publications. Uh, I, I may have touched on this before. The development, um, quite honestly, has been a little slow going because we are starting from scratch. Um, but the, the Visitors Bureau puts out the Visitors Guide. It's um, they've been doing it you know, obviously for years. It's quite successful, and they've just really been um, pretty gung ho with that effort. But uh, we do not have community-wide resources that focus on living in the community as a whole. So uh, we don't have a consistent resource of information that talks about our educational system and our healthcare system and what it's like to live here. I and mean, we have a fantastic publication about visiting here, but you know we want to convert those visitors to living here and working here. So um, cooperatively, we developed this live publication and you know, about local industry and what it's like to live here. And then also work, the other concept, is uh, resources regarding starting a business and navigating the red tape of well, when do I go to City Hall and talk to the news for zoning, or what if I'm in Nancy Township, or when do I go to the county clerk for DBA, or what's the health department's role? And some people, you know, we might take for granted that, oh, you just go talk to Joe, oh, you just talk to Denise, that, and it's really, um, you know, well, it's supposed to be resources to help the general public and get consistent information, regardless if they come to AES or the Chamber or City Hall or you know anywhere else. And they're getting resources in their hands that can you know, talk about the county as a whole, the community as a whole, um, for living here and for working here. So you know, what's available? Who can help me? And who does who does what? I hear that a lot. What's the difference between what you do and the Business Bureau? The chamber and you know, trying to, you know, the VA, you know, kind of sorting out whose role is what, you know, what does a brownfield authority do and how can it help redevelop, you know, a historic building or what, you know, what does the historic district commission do and, and how does that impact what I want to do when buying the building in River Street? So we're really trying to hopefully um, simplify, clarify, and just get a comprehensive resource in people's hands and get them excited about living here and working here and being in the community. So um, the Visitors Bureau publication will be available in December um, and then their usual schedule. And the Live and the Work publications will be in um, first quarter 2014. And then those, all three will be in digital versions. Um, the Visitors Bureau posts theirs on their website, but they will also, um, all, all three publications will end up being um, this is a website, um, the new website that AES will develop that really focuses on this. Um, and really, again, cross collaboration between you know, city, chamber, AES, county, and really just trying to be consistent, comprehensive, make it as easy as possible, regardless of somebody how, regardless of how somebody arrives in the city. I think that is all I have in my talk. A lot, and I get excited about this. Sorry, <laughs> I don't think it's a big problem. But I didn't get excited about it. Um, but does anybody have any questions for me? Is that going to be like one-stop shopping, where you can the business comes in, you, you don't shuffle them from this building to the county to you and? Uh, well, well, we're hoping. I mean, we're hoping that um, that we're going to have these resources. So at least if somebody picks up a booklet and it kind of helps them navigate. So. Unfortunately, you know, my office can't issue a DBA and I can't necessarily do zoning, but I mean, if we can at least hopefully mitigate having somebody shuffle around and feel like they're getting their, you know, red tape and the door slammed in their face, because 
city hall tells them one thing, and the chamber tells them something else, and the DEA tells them something else. So we're getting up a better award, um, and they really have been. I mean, a laundry list of stakeholders have been involved, and, um, and we're going to keep getting a laundry list more, and having this be the, the official comprehensive resource for our community. Um, one example can be used was at the Harbor Commission, and we've got these great people coming to visit. How great would it be to have a stack of these? You know, somebody picks it up and, you know, hey, you know, maybe this is a great place. They might see one portion of the community, but they might want to relocate there. So, um, and, and use, looking at also as a useful tool um, for physician recruitment is a big, big deal. Uh, West Shore Medical Center, um, James Barker, I mean, I, we talked about this, and, and they purchased the back cover of the lid. Like, yes, we want to support this. Um, again, we're, we're recruiting physicians. And me having, you know, working with different people that have come to my office, it's like, well, you can take this paper here, and you can copy that paper, or you can pull together this paper, you know, kind of scramble through all this information, but it's nice to be able to hand three different publications live or visit, depending on who your audience might be. You know, a physician recruitment, obviously, you want to do all three, but if somebody's a local resident, you know, already lives here, already knows all the great resources and they just want to start a business, then you can say, well, here's the work publication. Let's help you start navigating the process to make this a bit easier. Um, and say, you know, here we have access to a small business counselor. And again, you know, um, this is what a city brownfield authority does. This is what the county brownfield authority does. This is what you need to know about zoning. Um, think about zoning before you buy a building. Please, <laughs> think about the zoning. So, um, we're really hoping to really streamline that process and I'm thinking this is definitely a good step in that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Ms. Krista Johnson, who will report on the activities of the non motorized Transportation Committee. Based. 
There are hosted trail work days. There was just one this past um, set Sunday, and they're typically four-hour days. And here you can see a group of people, uh, they're walking, they're clearing the debris on what will be a ski trail in the winter, and then it gets mowed down really short so we can use it uh, when, when the snow conditions aren't just right. Um, and people of all ages, the support has been tremendous. Uh, in the park, uh, this was one of uh, one of our community members' dreams. Um, John Rajka, he was lost or passed away this year, uh, June 21st, and this was really his campaign. <coughs> he has been on the committee since <coughs> was founded, and he really led the charge to make sure this got developed for recreational use. Um, I'm pleased that he was able to see a lot of his dream come into fruition, and, uh, and we were naming a trail uh, under his name in the tribute. Uh, this year was our fifth annual Ham It Up Week. Uh, it's the third week in May, so it's a repeating event. Uh, our kickoff is always a 5K, uh, and this year we were participating again with Girls on the Run, as we did in the first Ham It Up. Uh, you can see in the top picture there, uh, there's a jazzercise warm-up led by Linda DeVries. She's been there every year and gets everyone pumped up. Um, there's the run start. There's a great turnout. On the lower uh, right-hand corner is uh, members from the Manistee Recreation Association. They help out with the registrations. The race takes place at the high school, um, and there's also a children's race after. And um, this is the cheapest race on the planet. It's ten dollars for an individual, fifteen for a family. All the money is donated back to the school for the track fund. And uh, um, I'm not sure what the total was, but it's you know just short of a thousand dollars that we're able to give them. So it's a it's a event that gives back, and hopefully will keep more runners on the road. Other events uh, have been line dancing. This is a picture from Just Country Kicking. They also have participated every year, and um, they host events year-round on Monday, Tuesday nights to teach people how to line dance. Um, there was hikes at Orchard Beach. Uh, bike group rides and time trials, garden challenges, swimming, jazzercise, walk a shelter dog, fishing for fitness, fitness classes both inside and outside in the parks, um, sites and shopping downtown, in Tai Chi, among some other events. Here's a brochure. On the front or the left side, you'll see that that's the cover from 2012, but 2013 looked very similar. And on the right is a schedule for 2013. Give you an idea. It's a pretty diverse group of events. We try to spread them throughout the city and try to really let them showcase what the city has to offer for people to become physically active. Uh, school participation. On uh, here, this is a clip or a picture from a video, so their pictures are not very clear. But one of the challenges to get schools involved with healthy, active living was a smart commute, in which a lot of the children all got together and they walked downtown, where there was uh, music and dancing. But you can see how downtown is just packed with kids. In the video, it's just they're just having a great time. Uh, Bear Lake schools they participated by having a jog challenge scavenger hunt, dance contest, so reaching people of all ages to become more active. We also had a walk and roll, and unfortunately we also lost another member this year, um, Richard Connected passed away in March, and, um, and he had been struck with polio when he was young. He brought a whole new aspect to the committee. Uh, he was a campaign person for accessibility. He brought a whole different set of eyes. And uh, unfortunately, he was not here for this, but uh, we were able to present his family with a, a letter of recognition. And the weather was terrible that day, so unfortunately, the walk and roll um, only went under the bridge <laughs> for the presentation. One of Richard's other um, things that was so absolutely important was the sidewalks. And uh, through his push for that, we were able to um, help a local scout, uh, Nick Vane, fulfill some uh, requirements. He with the Eagle Scouts, and then it was completed further with the National Honor Society. They went and examined every sidewalk in the city, whether it was every every detail. And you can see those are the binders that are public works, the amount of information that was gathered. 
this is a, a, a piece of one of the surveys, and it shows, it talks about the heaving, the slabs, those areas were missing, the damage. And this is going to be a tool for the city to see what areas are in greater need, where are we strong, where are we weak, and an opportunity to make improvements in the future. We also hosted a Labor Day Bridge Walk. Uh, 2013 was our third, 2012 was our second. And, uh, and it was partnered uh, each year, uh, just under 100 participants. They seem to come no matter what the weather. We've had beautiful weather. We've had cold, awful rain. Um, this helps to uh, continue the spirit of the Mackinac Bridge Day Walk. And we are fortunate we have two bridges, so it's about a five-mile walk. We do offer some turn-offs for people who don't want to go the distance. Um, this was tied in with the Live Well campaign that was going on this year, and we had Pureport Farms offer uh, refreshment stations, and we uh, went down the river walk, hit some downtown, covered the bridges. It's, uh, it's very well received. Here is, uh, on the left, you'll see the front page from the 2012, and you can see on the right uh, the map from the 2013 walk. The Promoting Active Communities is the award program that we've participated uh, since 2004. Um, there are three components of evaluation. Uh, Todd Miller, he's uh, one of the committee members, and he is head of the Labor Day um, Bridge Walk Projects. Um, what I'm handing you is the summary of the overview of our application from this year. It uh, shows your summary on the front, which is on the overhead, and then the pages will show um, the census information and give you an overview of what we answer, what kind of um, information we're um, strong at and where we need uh, improvements. But there's 14 sections, and those sections are uh, um, are what we fill out to get an award. And in front of you, you can see the previous uh, seven awards from 2004 through 2011 that I have on the table there. These key components, um, the three of them, planning and policy, uh, <coughs> we, get, we uh, earned a 74.6% in, in the evaluation process. Uh, that includes um, the planning, the ordinances, um, and, and anything that we've done into those improvements. This year, uh, one of the big things that we had changed was that we were able to implement and use the guide um, as a tool to set where are our strengths and weaknesses, and uh, it is now part of the zoning that with new constructions that non-motorized facilities are included. And a recent special use permit, permit did have a bike rack that's included in the permit. The built environment, uh, we scored an 87.1%. Um, this has, uh, this incorporates our beaches, our river walks, um, the, the non-motorized trail park, the signage that we have, the bike routes coming through the city. Programs and promotions that would include the Ham It Up and the Labor Day Bridge Walk, we score at 73.4. Um, I believe that uh, a weakness that we have here are work sites. I'd like to see if we can find a way to encourage work sites to get more on the um, physical active bandwagon and also schools could, could benefit from a little bit more participation. The awards that are in the picture there are the ones that you have in front of it. Uh, us, we, uh, in 2004, were awarded a level two. They had a different scoring system then. And then in 2005, we received a level three. In 06 and 07, when we went to the, the medals, per se, we received bronze. And then in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012, we received silver awards. We are the most consecutively awarded community in all of Michigan in the Promoting Active Community Program. So at this time, I would like to present the 2012 Silver Award, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Because every year I've asked 
for coal. And in 2013, we applied again. But now with the planning and policy changes, we got coal finally. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to present council with a gold or a gold. I need one more, sorry. Thanks. You just told me I have five minutes. Five minutes is less.
will not be subsidized. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to come forward? Yes, please come up to the microphone and state your name and address. Hi, my name is Michael Terry. I'm the Executive Director of the Ramsdale, uh, let's call it Theater and Cultural Center. We'll try that out, kind of start working on the branding. And I was asked to come to talk today a little bit about my first 30 days and what I've been up to. Uh, most of the time I've been spent uh, transitioning from the leadership of the finance office to my office. So I've been taking over the scheduling, the booking, uh, gotten into the marketing of uh, Metropolitan Opera. And this should say I could have up to the length of the Metropolitan Opera telecast. And uh, so I've been really kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of, of the day to day operations. Uh, I've been working the events, I've been working the weddings, I've been working the different events, and I'm really trying to understand how things work and what the opportunities might be for improving things. And so it's been uh, very insightful. Uh, also, one of my one of my pet projects in walking in is uh, there's a lot of stuff in the Ramsdale, a lot of stuff everywhere, and so I've been encouraging people to take a look at what they have, what they really need, where it is, and how they might, you know, maybe call through some of it and make some more space open, make it a little bit more organized. Don't want to throw away things that we need and want or going to use someday, but I think there's a lot of things that have just built up over the years, so that's something that kind of emphasizing everyone, really consider, do we really need this, what are we going to use it for? You know, we can use it down the road, great, but it's just something that's been sitting there for you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe we should take a look at it. Uh, the other thing I've been doing is I've been getting to know the resident companies, um, trying to learn you know, how I can best help them grow and, and become better at what they do. They're doing a lot, a lot of great things, and they've been very supportive in working with me, and I really appreciate all the efforts they've made We've uh, set up a monthly user group meeting so we can talk about some of the issues and opportunities. And it's given, I think, a lot of insight on to what, what some of the opportunities might be. I've also been learning about the Manistee community. I've met with uh, Travis Eldon from the Low Theater, with Rick Plummer from West Shore Community College. Uh, we'll be meeting, and I will be meeting with the Manistee Foundation in a couple of weeks to talk about, you know, what the vision is and where we might go, what the opportunities are. And uh, I guess that's, we're just we're just starting to talk about the process uh, to clarify the mission of the Ramsdale. I think everyone kind of has an idea of where we want to go, but I think it's really important to put in words and get agreement on it so we're all on the same page. And everything we're doing going forward is really to depend, dependent on that mission and those values that we all agree are important. And uh, that's something we're just starting, and I'm really looking forward to working on that. So it has been a really busy 30 days. I've been learning something every single day. I really do feel that I can have an impact, and I think there's a lot of support for the rents, though. I've been given a lot of support by the city and by the people I've talked to in the community. So I think there's a lot of support, and if we work together, create some trust and cooperation, I think we can make this a sustainable operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I appreciate the update. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No, I'm going to go on official staff. Super. A couple of quick things, Your Honor. Um, as you walk outside of the building tonight, uh, we had a demonstration that went on this afternoon about 4.30 uh, about uh, part of our sidewalk asset management plan again. We had a firm come in and do a demonstration on how to, if you have a slip and trip hazard, like an inch, inch and a half gap between two forms of concrete, they have a patented process where they actually have a saw which levels that, that incline out or removes that, that slip and trip hazard. Um, we have that demonstration done today. It's right out front of City Hall, so please look at that on your way out. It's on the top step by the railing. There was about an inch to an inch and a half gap, and you will see when you go out there how they have trim that down, if you will. Um, Jeff and I took some videos, so if you'd like to see some video, we have it over here also for you. But again, just take a look at that in your, as your way out. We think uh, there's some great applications for that. Traditionally, that costs about 25% of the cost of replacing that sidewalk square. Um, in addition to that, in the past, all the sidewalk squares 
had been removed by city staff. We take the concrete away. We bring in the topsoil. So it's pretty labor intensive from our employee standpoint. And if we can, if we can eliminate some of those time frames for our employees, as well as find a application which allows us to extend our finances and still uh, make our sidewalk safer, that's a good thing for us. So take a look at that on the way out, if you will. Um, a couple things about streets real quick. I just want to remind council that you all received this petition. This petition was uh, sent um, uh, early in, uh, we had it September 9th. Uh, it was emailed out to all We have an electronic copy of that. The, the individual had asked that, uh, acknowledged that this petition was uh, received by the city of uh, Manistee. He wanted me to write letters to all the city of Quincy residents. I did not, just letting you know that. However, you all have received copies of that particular petition. Um, there have been a lot of things in the newspaper as of lately regarding the condition of Quincy Street and such. Um, and as we talk about my weekly update, um, staff with staff and council, um, we are preparing right now for a December 2013 work session to present uh, an updated street asset management plan to City Council. Um, the first thing we need to do, and this will be very quick, is we need to update our current street asset management plan. You recall the street asset management plan was developed in 2008. It was a state awarded street asset management plan at the time. Uh, so we have sort of minor updates to do to that particular plan, and we will be representing that plan to City Council. Um, one of the things that we're also looking at is we're identifying what we have achieved over the past decade in regards to street upgrading. I think you'll be very, very impressed with what we have achieved over that time frame. Uh, streets improved, total miles improved, total costs improvements, local match and such. Uh, researching options for additional street revenue. That's going to be the big part. What are the options for additional street revenue? Um, some of the ideas that are just off the top of my head that we're going to explore more. Um, use of unused millage. We have approximately 0.5 mills under our, our limit that can be uh, assessed that would generate between eighty-five and ninety-five thousand dollars Again, to put that in perspective, uh, Quincy Street for the two blocks of the complete rebuild is $220,000 for a two block rebuild. Now that was, has drainage issues, so it's pretty high in that aspect, but just to put that in perspective, uh, voted street millages. Uh, we are, many communities are doing voted street millages. Uh, voted millages simply for streets, that's particularly an option. Other options could be special assessments to property owners, capital improvement funds, and continuing to look for grants. Uh, one of the things we are currently doing right now is we're benchmarking our other communities like Manistee and across the state to determine how are they addressing these street-related issues in these cash strap times. And with personal property tax, you can assure that we're not going to see additional revenue coming in from the state of Michigan in the near future. We'll be seeing less. So how do other individuals do that? Um, we want to update our road soft program. Uh, in regards to how will additional revenue that the council chooses to move in that direction, how will that impact our streets? If we put an additional 200000 into it a year, if we put an additional 400000 into it a year, how will that impact the streets? We can visualize that for you on the mapping program of the road stop program, so you can see that. Uh, and the other aspect is we want to identify, which will be pretty easy for the road stop, um, pager ratings, percentage of streets in the 1 to 3 range. Those are the very poor streets. Pager ratings for those uh, streets between four and six, those are your mid and good streets, and our pager ratings for roads scoring seven to ten, which are the best streets. Um, the issue that I think that we need to keep talking about is when we entered into uh, the asset management plan and the pager ratings in this program, we knew that there were going to be streets that were going to be difficult to address. Um, so that's what we're talking about right now. Um, Jeff, would you? pop up just a quick map here real quick. I thought this was interesting and Jeff was kind enough to um, prepare this for me this afternoon, if I can get it to work. Okay, um, probably need to zoom out a little bit. What we have here is, sorry about the orientation, um, kind of sideways a little bit, there you go. Um, the red streets that we have on this map throughout the city, these are streets that have been upgraded over the past five years. So, give or take, uh, I think Jeff thought about, I forget what the numbers were, about 12 miles of streets over the past five years of what we have upgraded 
um, either through grants from the state of Michigan, um, primarily grants and or um, uh, CSO work, combined sewer operation works. So we're at about 12 uh, miles of that. If you go out another two years, we're a little over 13 miles of streets that we have upgraded over the last couple of years. Uh, some of those are hot in place. The hot in place was, Jeff, you pointed those out on the north side. Uh, that would be the hot in places we're down there. And then uh, for Councilor Adams, that was, the, that was the fix that we put on your roads up there on Princeton Street, for example. Um, so I just thought this would be an important place for us to start with, if you will. And this will be incorporated what we bring forward to, to Council um, as we move forward. We, we all recognize the need uh, of trying to find out a way to upgrade streets. There's not a single person among staff or on council that doesn't want to upgrade streets. Um, the cost for upgrading streets is astronomical to upgrade streets. Um, so we need to look at what is the best, most efficient way that we can afford and that council chooses the direction we choose to move into to look at our streets. Our challenge absolutely is not going to be the major streets. We can occasionally find small urban grants and find other avenues, category A, if there's economic development and such. Our challenge, like every other community in the state of Michigan, is going to be how do we address these local streets? The local streets that some of these are 70 plus years old um, are in need of a complete rebuild. Um, which makes it the highest, most expensive cost. How do we afford to rebuild those streets? So that's going to be our challenge moving forward. And um, the December 10th work session is kind of that kickoff, if you will, uh, for us moving forward having these conversations. Uh, I think I described it the best. I almost kind of see it as a mini white paper, if you will, on street asset management. That would be Chief Backer and Backer in the back. Um, so, again, just wanted to quickly bring that to your attention as to what our plans are. If you have any ideas, if you want to discuss that in greater detail with me after the meeting or in the next month or so about some of your thoughts or ideas, uh, please feel free to give me a phone call. I'm happy to come out to where you're living or your place of work, whatever is most convenient, so we can discuss this. Um, again, that's kind of our plans for moving forward, and we just want to share those with council this evening. I would like to remind anyone who was going to have their event in the brochure the deadline is tomorrow. I can extend it out to the end of the week if necessary. Um, also, parade entries need to be sent in as soon as possible. If you have any interest in having an entry, you have any questions about it, please either call me, <coughs> excuse me, at 510-3691, or you can call the chamber office also. <coughs> Dry spot. Um, also, we are still looking for sponsors. If you wish to, if you feel a strong need to send money somewhere, the Sleigh Bell Festival will gladly accept it. We will be having fireworks again this year, <coughs> as long as the winds cooperate at the end of the uh, parade. <coughs> but that's, <coughs> but that's all. Thank you. <coughs> I just had a question on how the streets were done in front of our house. Was that complete or was that just a topic? Uh, the process was called hot in place. Yeah. Um, it was done. It was a process that was, and Jeff jumped up any time if I screw up. The process where we had two different vehicles. There were two different vehicles. The first vehicle, um, did a superheating project where it actually um, heated up your streets to the point uh, with, with propane and bricks, heated up to the point where following that heating process, we went in and we worked up the streets with metal tines. I think they went down an inch and a half to two inches into the about three inches, about three inches to break it up. At that point in time, it injects the oils back into that asphalt to rejuvenate 
that existing asphalt. Behind that piece of equipment is another piece of equipment that's almost like your traditional, um, uh, your asphalt layer coming on the back side of that. If additional asphalt is needed, that was a place where they would shovel, there was an auger mechanism, and then it relayed your streets coming, coming in there. At that point in time, after that process was done, that was not a wear course, so we had to come in with a, um, a ultra thin overlay, which is a, I think a three quarter inch topping of asphalt over the top of that um, is a wear course. So we did that. Um, we were able to do, I think, that year three plus miles. Three and a quarter miles. Three and a quarter miles of streets. Um, and give or take, how much of a cost reduction if we would have had to have done traditional? It was about equivalent to doing a one mile of city streets if we did a mill and fill. Do they still do that? Is that sure. Is it, it, is. it is still in our asset management plan. Um, I think that one of the things that we were looking at is, is that the Princeton uh, area up there is kind of a test subject kind of a little bit for us, as well as all of the, if you look on the north side of those, the, some of the precedent streets, the, the longer ones, when we get a hot place over there, too. Um, that we think we did that four years ago. It was in 2009. 2009, four years ago. So we're seeing how that's where we drove it today with the city engineer, Sean Middleton. They look pretty darn good, I think, still. I think so. Where you're at up there. Um, it's, it's not an application for every place. Yeah, the street has to be in a certain good enough condition. So it can't be used whether it's alligatoring or if your PISA rating is probably, what, six or lower? Six or five or lower. Five or lower. So it's, but, it's, but it's definitely a <coughs> tool that we can use in the future. Yeah, and that section of 12th Street that we did was absolutely not a good idea. Um, but we needed to do something and we were there. And so that's actually surprised the heck out of us at how well that's held up. Yeah. We, we honestly didn't think that was going to hold up because that was probably in a case of rating of a two or so, mm -hmm. two or three. Um, and quite frankly, it's held up much better than we thought it was going to. Yeah. I know Davis Street has held up very well from 8th. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that it was. Uh, it was. It's a good technique. Um, it's a. There's not a lot of firms which do it. The firm that we had was Gallagher. I believe they came out of Chicago uh, to, to do that particular hot and place application. It's quite processing. It's pretty good. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it burns the grass a lot of the side. Well, it's, got, it's, got all those, it's got all those bricks in the middle. So you're superheating the bricks, which superheats the, the asphalt to that point where the tines can break it up. Yeah, but it, it really did a nice job. Good. Yeah, I mean, from a point of perspective, when we build a new street, we're expecting that the asphalt life is going to last between 12 and 14 years before you start seeing a lot of distress cracking and stuff. Mm -hmm. This hot place has, um, what they offered was a five to six year life before we started seeing that. So, um, in fact, in driving the streets today, there is a lot of that reflective cracking that's coming back up. One, one of the things that doesn't show on here is that we have started a pretty um, consistent crack sealing program working in construction with the County Road Commission. And so we actually uh, separated the city into three separate quadrants and did, um, we did one quadrant one year, skipped a year, and then did the second and third, the, the third year. And so we're, we need to keep that going because where those, where that hot in place and the ultra thin overlays were laid, those cracks are opening up. Now we need to fill them and, and extend the life of that so it will be on that five and six year period. The crack ceiling is your first line of defense in the street asset management plan. It is the absolute first line of defense for us. I know it doesn't always look right when it's on the streets, but it, but it really does clear <coughs> our streets and keeps them uh, in their higher cancer rating than if we do not do it. Thank you. Is there any movement on Maple and Clark? I'm not sure that off. Um, there has not been much movement lately. Um, the last movement we had was probably <coughs> eight months to a year ago. Uh, we met with um, uh, County Commissioner Mark Burstrom, um, uh, Father Charter Township Chair Curtin Supervisor uh, Terry Walker, uh, the City of Manistee. At that point in time, there was a road commission member there. Uh, and there was some discussion about that. Um, the last discussion that I recall is, is that the two property owners, there's three property owners there, if you will, that are in Father Trevor Township. One is the uh, kind of the landscape, I think it's the landscape business, which is directly adjacent 
to the Manistee area public schools on the, the south side right there, that large Finchman area, directly adjacent to the Madison property. And then you have uh, private property, private property. All three are located within Fowler Charter Township. It's my understanding in talking to Mr. Bergstrom that the, that the large parcel was okay with straightening the road. The two property owners that were uh, on the corner and the next to them um, felt like that that would be taking of their property and they were not supportive of that. And at this point in time, uh, I have not talked to um, Commissioner Bergstrom and or Mr. Walker about that, but it appeared to die based on some of that provided information back from those residents. Does the road actually belong to the city now? It's on our Act 51 road map. Okay. It's actually, the entire road is on the northern half, that job, not the entire road, but that job is on the northern half of, uh, of that Act 51 right of way. So actually those two homeowners are encroaching on, on uh, township property. That is our belief. One of the things, just very clearly, I would not support ever fixing that road in its current configuration. Mm -hmm. Fixing it out where we straighten it, where it's we're removing the safety issue for all of our students and uh, all of our students and um, uh, parents <coughs> and teachers and bus drivers who traverse that route. Uh, yes. So really, it's just up to Filer Township to yes. take. Uh, Take the initiative then to. I think it's all up to all of us, I think, to sit down and work through a amicable resolution and do its best for the community. I would like to point out that this is actually, this map is based on our Act 51 map from MDOT. And the same scenario occurs between uh, Princeton and Maple Street, where, yeah, it sure does. where 12th Street is, is, the south side of 12th Street is in the township, mm -hmm. and the north side is in the city. But the Act 51 map gives the city responsibility and jurisdiction over that road. The same thing happens mm -hmm. on Cherry Road, all the way down to Murky Road, and then also on Murky. And on this map, you can see that Cherry Road is, is half in the township, it's half in the city. The Act 51 map gives the city jurisdiction over Murky Road, I'm sorry, over Cherry Road. On Murky, half of that, the north half is in the city, the south half is in the township. but through an agreement with the uh, Road Commission, the Road Commission maintains Murphy Road, and so they get the Act 51 funding for that. This is it's not uncommon for the for the jurisdictional lines to go down the center, but it's really up to these official maps on who's responsible for those streets. Okay. We have nothing, so I'll take a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll support. Can you adjourn?